Let's see what goodies come in this little kit. So we've got uh, the plastic for the case itself, all the screws to put it together, and not too many components. There's our little IC. We've got three knobs, and some capacitors, some pin jumpers, and some potentiometers. Our little screw terminals. And we've got some more goodies in here. Some more capacitors. There's our little jumper bridge. Our barrel connector power input. Another capacitor, some resistors, some more jumpers, and some more resistors. So as you see, it's not going to be that complicated of a build. What I don't see anywhere is the circuit board. It must be in here. Oh, no, it's in the instructions. Whew, getting a little worried there. And there's our little circuit board. And it shows where everything's placed. So following along is very simple. They've got all the resistor values listed, the capacitor values, and what the number is. And you just look at the number. The numbers are all listed right on the board. So R1, R2, C1, C2, etc. I've already separated everything out. I've got the 1K resistor, the 330 ohm resistor, and the 5.1K. There's three of those. We've got our little capacitors in order from 101 up to 470, what is that, three. Uh, I've got the two electrolytic, what are these, 10 microfarads, and the larger 100 microfarad. Our adjustable potentiometers, two are the same. They're B503, and there is B104. So just make sure that uh, you know which one goes into which spot. I'm not gonna show you every component here. I usually start with the smaller stuff first. If you've never done a board before, super easy. Uh, we'll start with the capacitors, the electrolytics, the side that's shaded, that's the negative. So you would find your negative pole on your electrolytic cap, which is this side here. And you just make sure that would go into that section of the board. Get out your solder and your soldering iron and tag it. One down, another dozen or so to go. So once your board's all together, just go over it. Make sure your orientation of the XR2206 function generator chip is correct. You want the little dimple at the top. And the other thing to note is these two 10 microfarad caps, you have to bend them back a little bit. You can't have them sticking straight up. They stick up a little too high when you're putting the top cover on. And then just go over your back. Maybe you have to have all the pins pretty short. On that note, the pins for the barrel jack power input, they're quite tall. I actually had to shave them down with a Dremel sanding disc. I couldn't cut them short enough, but I've, I've got pretty crappy side cutters. So that could be a reason why. But just go over all your solder joints. Make sure there's no shorts or anything. Everything's nicely saturated. And this is all through hole. It's a plated through hole component. So if you want to look, just make sure the solder is coming through on the back on the top side as well. But really nice little board. They, uh, they did a good job with it. Now let's get the case on. 
so one pain is getting all this uh getting all the well the protective coating i should actually have gloves on here because i don't want to get fingerprint marks on all this stuff but it just peels off try to peel it off all in one piece and there you can see all the etching there's still some protective tape in it getting all that protective film off is the fiddliest part of this entire build to get the little remaining pieces of protective paper film out of the etched text on here i just had to use some isopropanol with a microfiber cloth the isopropanol is safe on it wouldn't use anything harsh though just in case it melts it and fogs it up so we get our, our little screws and it's kind of odd but you put these little the little guys through with the nut on the back side there's four of them and that's just a standoff for the board the nut and the little screw locates the board on the bottom plate so the board isn't floating around in there so you see it just locates it they just go in these holes they don't screw in or anything and then we put our sides on takes a while to get everything lined up come on and now we can put our long screws in and they just thread into the plastic so don't over thread them or you'll just strip them out so yeah just thread it in and stop as soon as it's getting just moderately tight otherwise you'll strip those screws out for sure and there's not much thread biting in there maybe two threads if that ah oh, probably three oh no it's probably three that's it now we'll just center our potentiometers and we'll put our knobs on so it's coarse frequency adjustment fine frequency adjustment amplitude of the frequency let's test this thing out to power it up you need 9 to 12 volts dc it uses a 5.5 by 2.1 barrel connector so the outside diameter is 5.5 the pins 2.1 uh, i've just got a uh, standard barrel jack here for that it's plugged into my power supply set at 10 volts kind of wish it had a uh, led to tell you that it's powered up you, you could obviously add that quite easily just put a little surface mount led and a current limiting resistor there and wire it right into the power input of the barrel jack but uh, that's a little mod that could be done. So I've got it set at the lowest frequency right now, which is one to 10 Hertz. Channel two, which is the blue, that's measuring the square wave output, which is the red wire here that I've got coming out to my channel two probe. And then my channel one is the yellow line and that's uh, going to my channel one probe and that will register either um, sine waves or triangle waves and i've got the these turned right full down the fine and coarse frequency adjustment knobs and as you can see we're getting just little blips on the square wave and let's just turn the voltage per division up on the channel one we're at what 800 milliseconds per division so we're getting uh, just over half a hertz here so very slow it's actually lower than one hertz so let's move it to the 100 to or the 10 to 100 hertz scale so we'll just move that jumper up and a little bit more excitement going on here there we go okay so certainly not <laughs> a square wave here it's more just a little pulse trails off probably some capacitance pulse trails off uh, what are we getting here though so this is seven hertz and we'll dial these right up so the frequency changes on both obviously equally and it goes up to 216 hertz so that's certainly within the range of 1 to 100 uh, let's go to 100 to what's the next one three kilohertz just dial this down again so we're getting what 141 hertz so that's a little bit higher than the 100 
Got those dialed right down. Dial them right up. See what our frequency goes up to here. 4.18. Waveform doesn't look too bad. Notice the, uh, the square wave is now a proper square wave. Nice sharp corners on it. So let's do, what's the next one? 3K to 65 kilohertz. So I'll dial them right down again. Oops, should have done that first. And we're at 2.8. So that's certainly right around our 3K. And we'll dial it right up. And we're at 83 kilohertz. So that's a bit over our 65, but certainly within the range. Getting a little noise there. That's interesting, the uh, the amplitude knob, so what changes the voltage output, it only works for the sine wave. It has no effect on square wave. Square wave output is whatever it is, what are we at here for 5 volts per division, so roughly 10 volts. So the square wave is putting out as much power as we're putting in, or as much voltage as we're putting in. And the sine wave, though, is what we can change the amplitude at, but it clips the clips the bottom of the wave once you get over a certain voltage and it's backwards the voltage increases as you turn the knob counterclockwise okay and let's check out the uh, last one here which is what 65k to 1 megahertz and we'll dial this right down so the wave's still looking not bad what are we at 55 kilohertz so that's certainly uh, it's about 10 kilohertz below the 65 that it says it'll do. And we'll dial it right up. Now these waves are getting just gross looking. The square wave is no longer square. And it's going right up though to 1.27 megahertz. Let's just dial that down. See if we can get it right around one megahertz, see if that improves the wave at all. No. The wave looks pretty gross once it gets much over f 500 kilohertz. It really starts rounding it out on the square wave. Now let's just see what the triangle wave looks like. Not much difference there, is there? Let's just go back to a medium frequency so we can see this sine wave. Oh yeah, so there's the sine wave and triangle. It definitely does a triangle wave nice. I would try out the triangle wave at this early low frequency. That's more of a square wave. Absolutely gross. Ones that turn into a sine wave or a triangle wave. It's more of a sawtooth wave at uh, 20 hertz. There, she's a proper triangle wave now at 400 hertz. There, yeah, it's right at. It's about 100 hertz where the, the triangle wave actually starts becoming a proper triangle wave. So yeah, limitations for sure. You're not gonna get very great waveforms out of this thing, but hey, it's fun to play around with. So, you know, for 10 bucks or whatever these are, not bad, right? They don't give great output, but it's a neat little thing to play around with. If you wanna practice your soldering skills and you want a little waveform generator on the cheap, it works. But uh, yeah, you wouldn't want it for really accurate waveform generation. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.